And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us on the line. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. How are you doing this fine Thursday morning? I'm doing very well. It's cooler. Despite the early hours of the morning. <laughs> this is true. Do you notice that the sun is rising a little bit later? <laughs> I know. It's, uh, it, we're approaching for the colder seasons. Winter is coming, as they say. You skipped a few months ahead. <laughs> I know. But in Korea, the spring and the fall, they all seem so short. It's like in the space of a week or a few weeks, it seems like the, the weather suddenly turns for the worse. <laughs> so, yeah, very short-lived, the, the prime seasons of spring and fall. Yeah. Glad to see that the Thursday optimism is alive and well. Thank you very much for joining us, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the day before Friday, so I'm a bit less optimistic than I should be, but uh, I guess things will be different tomorrow. <laughs> All right, I'll check in tomorrow as well. Let's jump into our mm -hmm. keyword news portion. We're going to try to highlight some of these major headlines for our listeners. This is our first pick of the day. Korea-China relations. So Korea and China held joint ceremonies to commemorate 30 years of diplomatic ties. The events were held in their respective capitals and attended by their top diplomats. So what came up at the respective ceremonies? Right. Well, the events were held simultaneously via video links, so they were kind of broadcast to each other. They weren't mm. separate events. Uh, now, Park Jin and Wang Yi read out congratulatory messages from President Sun Sung Yeol and Xi Jinping. Both leaders took note of the importance of the relationship between the neighboring countries. They voiced hope for closer cooperation going forward as well. Yoon, in particular, he expressed hope uh, to meet with Xi face to face. And the Chinese president agreed to strengthen strategic communication, in his words, with Yoon. And he added that the two nations should become good neighbors, friends and partners. So in terms of the rhetoric, it does seem like things do uh, look pretty rosy in terms of their diplomatic relations mm. and any prospects of it. Mm. Uh, Seoul's top diplomat also said South Korea-China relations are facing a new historic turning point. And he called for efforts to turn a crisis into an opportunity. He also said the UN administration will work with China for progress in the so-called audacious initiative that was touted by President Yoon. That was the economic aid for denuclearization kind of proposal made by the UN administration. Park also underscored the need to enhance cooperation in the cultural sector as well and promote pe to, uh, people uh, to people exchanges. Um, prior to the ceremonies, meanwhile, Park and Wang participated in a virtual session in which the Committee for Future-Oriented Development of Korea-China Relations, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, mm. submitted a set of policy suggestions. It's basically a panel um, that was set up last year to kind of figure out ways of trying to bolster uh, relations between the two countries. And mm. the panel suggested two plus two talks involving vice foreign and defense ministers, mm. not just summit level meetings uh, and cooperation on supply chains and maritime issues. Seoul and Beijing also held a remote business forum. During that, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang called for quick progress in follow-ups, uh, follow-up uh, FTA negotiations with Korea and he described the two countries as inseparable neighbors that should work together to defend supply chain stability. So mm. it seems like the overall atmosphere of these meetings was uh, kind of optimistic in terms of mm. their relations. Mm. Um, but of course, this is a diplomatic event right. and usually things that are mentioned in these events don't really apply in the real world. So we'll have to see <laughs> how those relations do actually pan out yeah. and what kind of uh, pr uh, proposals and policies are uh, established going forward. It is a general framework and the intent is really clear. I mean, it was to commemorate the 30 years of diplomatic ties. So given the nature of the event, of course, it'll be cordial in tone. That mm -hmm. is the diplomatic game. But we did set aside the thorny anti-missile system issue at the event, which is kind mm -hmm. of at the heart of this tug of war between the two countries. So you're right. Let's keep tabs. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the economic section of uh, our daily updates. This is our second keyword of the day. 
Avoiding financial crisis. The next one, that is. Uh, with high inflation and rising interest rates, President Yoon has vowed to make a thorough preparation to prevent another financial crisis and ease of people's economic burdens. That's right. He made the remark uh, while presiding over a macro financial meeting uh, that was attended by government officials as well as economic experts as well. He said the government is going to thoroughly monitor and take measures to prevent any financial or foreign exchange crisis. Of course, the Korean one has been depreciating quite rapidly recently. Uh, he cited downside risks, such as the weakening one and widening trade deficits, as well as high inflation and, of course, interest rate hikes, not just here in Korea, but pretty much worldwide at the moment, including the US Fed, uh, with more to come, in fact. And he did note that the Korean economy's external financial soundness has improved significantly, but he did warn against complacency, uh, saying that the country do need, does need to remain vigilant. Uh, now, while global oil and grain prices have stabilized, Yoon said the country continues to face inflation risks due to Russia's reduction of gas supplies to Europe. Um, and he also said interest rate hikes in major economies and the surrounding uncertainty have added to the volatility of financial markets and mm. increased the potential for a global economic slowdown. So, yeah, we are in a lot of um, downside risks at the moment that is weighing on the economy, not just uh, locally, but global as well. Mm. Uh, so that's why... Yoon is vowing to take measures to prevent any fallout from that. Mm. Uh, let's take a look at the country's fertility rate. It is related to what we're talking about, the economy section, that is our third keyword of the day. Record low childbirth. So Korea's total fertility rate hit a record low last year as the number of childbirths continued to fall. It is a similar narrative, but every time there is an update, we must update our listeners. So tell us the details of this latest numbers. Right. It certainly is a similar narrative. It's kind of uh, been plaguing the country for years now. Uh, it's just a matter of updating the numbers. Uh, Statistics Korea data shows that total fertility rate, which is the average number of children a woman bears in her lifetime, came to 0.81 uh, in 2021. That's down from 0.84 uh, the previous year. Uh, last year also marked the fourth straight year that the number was below one. And Korea was actually the only country where the number of childbirths per woman uh, remained below one among the 38 OECD nations. Mm. And as of 2020, the total fertility rate among the OECD averaged 1.59. So it just goes to show how much uh, of a kind of um, bad news that is in terms of fertility rates. Right. And Korea is grappling with a chronic fall in childbirths, as many young people delay or pretty much give up on uh, getting married and uh, having babies amid an economic slowdown and high housing prices. This is all coupled with changing social norms about marriages as well. So just uh, outside of those economic concerns, mm. people uh, nowadays, they're not really that focused on getting married as uh, they used to be in Korea. So that is kind of the changing social norm. Mm. Uh, Korea also logged the lowest number of childbirths in the second quarter of this year. The number of newborn babies was just under 60,000. That's down about 9% from a year earlier. It was the first time since data began to be compiled in 1981 that childbirths fell below 60,000 in the second quarter. Uh, the number has been on the decline since the first quarter of 2016. Um, the number of deaths also stood at just over 90,000 in the second quarter. That's up 20.5% on year. It was the second highest quarterly figure after posting a record six-figure high mm. in the previous quarter amid of course, the continued pandemic, which shot up those death uh, rates. For policymakers, it's about preparing for a quickly aging society, as we continue to talk about. But on a personal level, you're right. I think the social norms have shifted. Uh, women getting higher degrees, for example, more full timers. That also does result in later marriage or just foregoing it altogether. You mentioned really good points about unaffordable housing getting in the way mm. of seeking or prioritizing marriage, too. These are just many of the moving parts. Uh, let's next talk about the COVID-19 situation in the country. This is our fourth keyword of the day. 
COVID subsides. So COVID cases have been steadily falling, though the latest numbers do show daily cases surpassing the 100,000 mark again. Experts believe, however, that the peak of the recent wave has passed. Another one subject to come in the fall season. Yeah, so we do always have to be cautiously optimism and do take Mm -hmm. these figures with a grain of salt because especially over the past few weeks, the figures have been quite volatile. Uh, going in and out of that five and six uh, uh, digits. Now, daily infections jumped to just over 180,000 cases last Wednesday. Then it fell over the past five days, tallying just under 60,000 on Monday. Tuesday's tally rebounded to just over 150,000. Uh, and there were just under 110,000 cases as of 9 p.m. yesterday. So it just goes to show how volatile those numbers have mm. been. Now, the recent decline in new infections, uh, as I mentioned, it is raising cautious optimism that the latest virus wave may have passed its peak, but authorities remain on high alert over a possible resurgence in the COVID-19 pandemic this fall. That's kind of been a prediction uh, during the early uh, earlier this year as well, that the, there'll be a resurgence of infections in the colder seasons. Um, But for the time being, the KDCA expected the number of daily infections will show the reduction trend this week or next week. Uh, Critically ill patients and COVID deaths are, however, likely to increase uh, in the next two to three weeks. Um, The KDCA projects the number of critically ill patients could reach between uh, 800 to 900 in early September. For deaths, it forecasts 100 to 140 Uh, But high-risk facilities, such as nursing homes, they are still kind of on alert amid a surge in cases there. And this has prompted the government to kind of bring back some restrictions on visitations at Mm. such facilities, especially ahead of the Chusak season, when a lot of people do visit their elderly relatives in such places. All right. And with that, let's move on to our final keyword of the day. Budget plans. So the government and the ruling party have agreed to focus on easing inflation woes and helping job seekers in drawing up next year's budget. Tough times, more aid. Mm, That's right. They say they are focusing on society's vulnerable groups Mm. and also the future generation uh, in planning the national budget for next year. The head of the PPP's policy committee also said the broader goal was to shore up the nation's fiscal soundness through the five years of President Yoon's term. Now, the budget plan aims to provide 3 million won to young adults who complete job searching programs. Those programs are in place for basically young people who uh, have uh, pretty much tired out or exhausted their Mm. methods of finding a job. Mm. Now, the support measure is aimed at helping them make a leap towards employment, so giving them just that little bit of help in trying to get a job. Now, the government and the party also agreed to include the budget plan uh, way... uh, Uh, Mm. include in the budget plan ways to raise energy vouchers provided to low-income households by 50%. Mm. Uh, Such vouchers aim to support low-income families in paying basically their utility bills, Mm. so basically um, those important necessities. Now, the budget proposal will also seek to help some 250,000 small business owners as well as self-employed settle their debts. Uh, The budget proposal will also include funds for construction of these deep underground tunnels in Seoul uh, designed to prevent flooding. We mentioned this in uh, a previous segment. Now, the government plans to submit the budget proposal to the National Assembly um, next Friday. And as, as is always the case with budgets, they are always an area of contention between the rival parties. So we'll have to see how much or uh, if the uh, opposition Democratic Party are on board with some of the proposals being Mm. made. Uh, uh, So, yeah, nothing's final yet, but these are the proposals being made so far. Thank you very much, Anna, for today's coverage. It is slightly cooler, so I hope you have a pleasant Thursday. (laughs) It certainly is, yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.